spiritual joining together. Thank you much, so much for being here. We're going to join our service back into the live auditorium. Welcome to iCampus. You're a part of that. Thank you for doing that. But even beyond that, we actually take this message out into the community. And so all summer long, we're going into different communities and especially working with children and family there. And so thank you because your giving doesn't just take, you know, help what goes on within the four walls. It helps what goes on outside of these walls into the community and literally around the world. And I'm just going to appeal to some of you, you know, to give of yourself, to give of your lives, not just of your resources, to volunteer, to help in our children's ministry, to volunteer and help going out on Thursdays. We're doing it every Thursday of going, going into these communities and just interacting with kids, building relationships, mentoring, and then using the influence that we build to lead them to faith in Christ by sharing our faith with them and our understanding of God and his word and, and his will and his ways and all of that. And so if you're willing to do that today, right after the service, if you're willing to help out our children, they're actually having a meeting of all the current volunteers, new volunteers, people who were just interested. You say, I'm not signing up for anything yet. I just want more information on what that's about. Because I understand some of you would say, I, you, you may think, I'm not very confident in, in the Bible. I don't know a whole lot there. Or, you know, I'm, I'm still new in my own faith. Or you may just say, I'm just not comfortable teaching and speaking. Let me tell you, that is the best place for you to get where you can grow. Because as you are teaching them, God will be doing something in you. And you may be sharing stories that you're learning and hearing for the first time. And in that, your faith is growing and you've developed a relationship that not only is helping these children, it's helping these parents put them at ease that there are other people that are partnering with them to help them and their children. So when we give, it's not just about giving of our resources. It's really about giving of our lives, our experience, everything about us. So thank you for being the kind of church that gives in that kind of way. Again, right after service, if you want to help out in any of our children's areas, nursery all the way up to like fifth grade and, and beyond, just hang around afterwards. They'll feed you lunch, and they'll give you a lot more information about how you can fit in there. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for our children, for trusting us with children for trusting us with not only our own children, but Heavenly Father, with one another's children and children within this, this entire community. Lord, I thank you that you have brought them to us and you're sending us to them. It says so much about what you're doing in us and through us and how your gospel, your good news, what you want to do is going throughout the world because, Heavenly Father, we have joined with you and you've used us as your servants, as your messengers, as your conduit for getting this out there. Lord, I thank you for everyone who is here financially giving. Lord, for those who are unable to, but they have the heart to, and they've not developed the habits yet, I pray that you would help them to develop the financial habits they need so they can participate in what you're doing. Heavenly Father, for those who have the heart to, even the habits to, but they just don't have the resources, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bless them, that you would open up doors of opportunity, that you would bless them with jobs and, and, and careers, Heavenly Father. If, if it's a health situation, that you would heal them and restore them. But Lord God, that you would provide for your people so that your people can be involved in what you're doing. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Everything has a beginning. It's a driving force in our human experience. Every person, every idea, every journey starts somewhere. Whether it's one small step in a new direction or a catalyst that ignites a spark, it's a moment when, from this point forward, nothing will ever be the same. It's not always comfortable. It's not always easy. But it is a start. We have been talking for several weeks about an, an adult starting point for faith. Because a lot of us, our starting point when it comes to faith and, and what we know about God and believe about God and how we relate to God, that starting point started as a child. And it wasn't because we chose anything. Um, we were handed something. Most people were handed a faith or something to believe when they were a child. Okay? There was very few of us, maybe not any of us, but very, very few of us were ever handed a book about world religions and told, pick one. Right? Okay, here you go. Pick one. All right, there are some families who do that now, 
But most of us, that's not how it happened. You know, you were probably handed a Bible. It was signed by mom and dad or signed by a grandparent. And, and they were, you know, you're told to read that or maybe somebody read it to you. And even if it wasn't a Christian faith, you were handed some other faith. But whatever it was that you believe about God, whether there is God, there isn't a God, and what you believe about life and God and interaction and all that stuff, you were handed as a child. But the problem is, and this is what we've been talking about, is that our childhood faith doesn't always stand up to adulthood experiences. And so some of the stories that you heard about the Bible or what you heard at church or what your grandmother told you and all that about God doesn't always seem to line up with real world reality from our perspective. You know, we've heard that God is good, but yet bad things happen. We hear that he rewards good people and punishes bad people, but we see bad people doing really, really good. And we see good people sometimes suffering. And all of that just doesn't seem to line up with our adulthood experience. And here's the thing. This is true about your childhood faith not lining up with adulthood experience. This is true if you were one of those who was handed the Bible and told, here, believe this, (laughs) right? It's also true if you were handed another religion. It's also true if you were handed no religion at all. See, there are people who are here who are part of our Bridge Church family. They were handed you know, a faith by maybe their parents or someone else that said all paths lead to the same reality, to the same God, and all things are equally true. And that's the faith that they were handed. But as they became older and adults, that childhood faith did not stand up to adulthood reality either. There were some who were told by their parents, there is no God, and there is nothing except other than just chance and chaos or or, or evolution, or processes, or you know, biology, and all that. But that faith from their childhood has not stood up to adulthood experiences, and you're still left as an adult saying, there's got to be more than this. So it doesn't matter which side of the equation you're on when it comes to Christianity, or you know, faith in God, or the Bible. If you were handed the Bible, sometimes that fell away. If you were not handed the Bible, whatever you were handed has sometimes fallen away. So our question has been, if we're going to start over as adult, with adulthood faith, where would we start? And here's what I know for many of us, it's true for me, I'm sure it's true for many of you. For many of us, the starting point of our adult faith that became the ending point for many of us was a failed attempt to bargain with God. Okay, when we crossed into adulthood, forget what we learned at childhood, at some time, maybe you were a teenager, 14, 15, somewhere in there, or maybe you were in college, or maybe you were, you know, much older adult, but at some point you said, okay, forget what everybody told me. I'm going to launch out on my own here. And it became the starting point for many of us. It became the ending point because we had this failed attempt to bargain with God. You know what I'm talking about, right? Everybody bargains with God, okay? We've all made a bargain with God. Atheists and agnostics, if the situation and circumstances get desperate enough, we'll bargain with God, okay? We all bargain with God. Here's what it sounds like. God, if you will, then I promise I will, okay? Or God... If you will stop that, I promise that I will stop this. If you promise not to, then I promise not to, right? And this is the bargain we have. And sometimes when life and circumstances, I mean, it may have started out when you're 14, 15. Oh God, if you will let her say yes to the dance, then I promise I will be a missionary in Africa, okay? Whatever it may be, it's big, isn't it? I mean, we go, God, if you promise, the pregnancy test comes back negative, then I promise I will, right? God, if you will land me the job, then I promise I will. And sometimes it gets really serious. God, if you will heal them, I promise I will. God, if you will bring them back, then I promise that I will. And for some of us, this was a starting point in faith, and it really grew. In fact, I've got a friend of mine named Garrett out in um, uh, Somerville. I said I wasn't going to use his name, but I texted with him this morning. He was so excited. He actually said he wanted to record this, take it to heaven with him, because it might help him get past the gates. He said they were a little iffy on him. And, but here's the thing. Garrett has this incredible story, you know, as he was already a, you know, a Christian coming into faith in Christ and you know, was already there. But he, he was wrestling with finances and how to deal with his finances. And so he has cars that he likes to sell cars, or maybe he just sells cars and you know, gets a car and decides he wants another car. So he had this one car that wouldn't sell, and he just does this bargain with God. God, if you will sell my car, then I promise I will give money to the church. God, if you will sell my car, I promise I'll give money to the church. I'll start tithing. I'll start giving regularly a portion of my income, you know, tithe 10%. And so he makes this bargain with God, and guess what? God did it. I mean, just shortly, I mean, like with days of selling the car, a guy comes to his house to visit and says, hey, what are you going to do with that car out there? And he goes, well, I'm thinking about selling it. He's like, I want it. And it was like unsolicited sale of the car. There it was, right? 
And so he's like, oh my goodness, God, now I've got to keep up my end of the deal. And he did. And he can tell you how his life has been transformed and how God has done something incredible. His eyes are open. Now he's become this incredibly, incredibly generous guy, all because of this starting point of he made a bargain with God. But that's not how it works for most of us. See, most of us are more like, you know, the woman I heard about going to the mall on Black Friday. Oh God, if you will give me a good parking spot, I promise I'll go to church Sunday. Never mind, God, I found one. Here it is. It's right here. (laughs) Uh, Because that's how we are, isn't it? Oh God, if you will give me this, I promise to do that. But here's the truth about all of us, okay? Most of us will not give God credit when he does it, and we won't keep our promise when he does. It's like, oh, I need the parking spot. Oh, never mind, God, I found one. He doesn't get the credit. You think you found it. And so, therefore, I'm not going to keep the promise. And they know how it is. We go to this, God, if you will. See, God, if you will, then I will. And the thing is, even if he does, we don't. And he knows that. You see? And so, bargaining with God doesn't usually work for us. But this is what's interesting. Bargaining with God is an expression of really, really big faith. See, if you're in here and you say, I'm not a person of faith, but you've ever made a bargain with God, you've ever even tried to, if you've ever thought, God, if you will, then I will. If you've ever done that, if you've ever thought that, it is an expression of some really, really big faith that you might not realize you have. Because here's what happens, okay? Bargaining with God expresses your belief that God exists and he hears you. As soon as you say, God, if you will, what you are saying is God exists and he's listening. And he's not just listening to people. He's listening to you. Here's the other thing. Bargaining with God expresses that God can intervene and he'll help, that he can actually do something. And so you're already expressing faith in him when you start to bargain with him. When you bargain with him, you're expressing that God cares about you, that he gives a rip about whatever it is that you're wanting him to do or that you need. But here's the biggest thing that sometimes we kind of overlook. It's in the shadows back there. We don't really talk about it. We need to bring out. Bargaining with God expresses your belief that you have something God wants. God, if you will do this, then I will finally give you what you want. God, if you will sell my cars, I'll give you my money. Because you want my money. I mean, at least that's what all the pastors want, right? They want the money. <laughs> God, if you will, then I promise I will be good. Because what you want is my good behavior. God, if you, and listen, we don't keep our promises because if we were going to keep our promises, there would be a whole lot more people in churches everywhere today. In fact, if we were going to keep our promises, Africa would be filled of a lot more missionaries because so many of us made some big promises we've not kept and going to Africa might be one of them, right? If, if we had kept our promises, we wouldn't have all the problems we're having today. But what we're thinking when we make the promise is, God, I know there's something that you want. You want me to go to church. You want me to behave. You want me to do the right thing. You want me to give some money. Maybe you want me to do a little good in the community. So, God, I promise if you do this, I'll give you what you want. But this is why bargaining with God doesn't usually work. This is why it's usually failed attempts to bargain with God. Because it is hard to bargain with somebody who doesn't need anything. There's no leverage point there. You see, it is hard to bargain with a God who doesn't want something from you, but wants something for you. And we know this is true because as kids, some of us tried to bargain with our parents and it didn't work. Because our parents, any good parent doesn't want something from you. A good parent wants something for you. I mean, good parents aren't saying, I can't wait till that kid grows up and makes a lot of money so I can take it. Not good parents. I mean, some of you have parents like that, but they're not good parents. Okay, good parents don't do that. Good parents don't think of all the stuff they want you to accomplish so that it can then come back on them. Good parents don't want something from you. Good parents want something for you. And so it's hard to bargain with parents when there's nothing you have they really want other than you, other than just a relationship with you. See, God's intervention in our life is not a give and take. And that's how we deal with our relationships with other people. When I'm going to step in and help you with your problems, we kind of assume there's this give and take. You help me, I'll help you. Quid pro quo, right? Quid pro pro quo. That's how we are. But that's not how God's intervention. It's on grace and mercy. His intervention is grace and mercy. Now you hear about these words all the time, but let's just not assume anything. Let's just go back as as, as a starting point and define what we mean by grace and mercy. First with mercy. Mercy is the easing or the lifting of deserved penalty, suffering, or punishment. Right? Whenever you deserve it, you did something and you are reaping the consequences. We would call that justice. 
Okay, you committed the crime. Now you're doing the time. We call it justice. You broke it. You bought it. We call that justice. So when there is an interruption in justice and there's an easing or a lifting of what we deserve, we call that mercy. And God operates in mercy. God is a God of mercy. Now, I know some of you are going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, minute. let's go back to the Bible for a second. Some of you read it. And there's stuff in the Old Testament, you know, the first few books back there, where it doesn't look like God is a God of mercy because he is wiping out or telling, you know, his people to wipe out entire cities, entire nations. I mean, they're just going in and plowing over some people, and it's just brutal and it is bloody, and it seems that this was at the command of God. See, this is what's interesting. I mean, it becomes almost hypocritical of us, okay? It's this tension that becomes hypocrisy if we push it too far. And here's what I mean by that. If God was to wipe out all of your enemies because of their sin, you would call that justice and you would praise him for being a just God. God, thank you so much for bringing your judgment on all of my enemies who did wrong. You know they were guilty. They deserved it. But when God doesn't do that to us because of our sin, we praise him for his mercy. So when we look at the Bible, we sit there and go, how can he be merciful? Look what he did. Hey, wait a second. Let's look what they did. And what they did might have been deserving. Just like if we really want to look at what you and I have done, it may be deserving of the punishment we're trying to avoid. So here's this tension that when bad things happen to bad people who've done bad, we would call that justice. But when good things happen to people, who have done bad. What do you call that? Well, that word is grace. Grace. Undeserved favor. See, you know, you drank the stuff, you got in the car, you started driving, and you made it home. You think you're just slick by avoiding all the cops and not getting a DUI. You don't see it as mercy and grace. You see it as you being slick. But that's mercy and that's grace. The fact that you survived, right? The fact that they didn't find out about your secrets and they've continued to stay married to you. What do you call that? I'm just really good at getting away with it. But it's grace and mercy. But as soon as God just allows you to receive what you deserve, now you look at him and go, he's not very gracious, he's not very merciful. No, he's also just. And there's the tension. Justice, mercy, And there's a big gap in there sometimes. So when you read the Bible, sometimes you're looking at it and you're seeing it through the eyes of justice. Sometimes you're seeing it through the eyes of mercy. But we never pause to say, what did we deserve? What did they deserve? Did I earn that? You know, undeserved favor, unmerited favor. Now, Paul, you know, Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, a collection of letters and writings and all of that that he sent to churches and to, to new followers and new believers and all that, and he compiled to make a lot of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, when he writes about this to this group in Ephesus, and this wasn't written to any specific group or any specific church or anybody. These weren't, he, he wasn't writing it actually to people he knew by name and interacted with. He's writing a general letter to general you know, followers of Christ that he has heard about that are all in this you know, major port city at the time. And so when he writes this general letter to all these people, he's writing it to us as well. And here's what he said in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. Starts out pretty harsh right here. He says, as for you, all of you, okay, and again, he's he's writing to people who are already on the other side of faith. They're Christians. So he's talking to them, but those of you who are non-Christians, you'll get this as well. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin. Dead. Let me look at transgressions and sin first. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Okay, if you've just now started tuning in on the series, go back online and watch some of the earlier message, and you will hear that we're not just people who make mistakes. We are what was sinners. Okay, so here's the thing: transgression. Oops, I messed up. We were dead because of our mistakes. Oops, I messed up. But we're also dead because I meant to, right? The sins. Yeah, I knew that was wrong, and I did it anyway. I knew what he said, and I didn't care. I knew that might bite me, and I did it anyway. It was fun. I got away with it. It was for a while. It was good, okay? So you're dead because of your oops, I messed up, and because of your willful violation and disobedience. So I don't care how you want to play that. You're dead. And he picks the strongest word he can, you know, come around with to to explain this relationship. So understand dead. If you were standing on the stage here with me, and we were talking, and suddenly gripped your heart, gripped your head, had the aneurysm, whatever it was, and boom, 
And that's it. They came in, they checked your pulse, they did all of that, and you are, you know, whatever they say, DTR or DRT, dead right there. Okay, there you are, dead right there, okay? No longer moving, no longer breathing, no brain activity, no lungs. You're dead. When you're dead, our relationship ends, okay? I am now not having a relationship with you. I am now doing nothing but observing. When you go to the funeral home, see them in the casket, all you're doing is looking. You're not relating. Because when you're dead, there can be no relationship with those who are alive. You understand that you're dead. Now, let me ask you this. Once the person is dead, what can they do? Nothing. Okay, you said, oh, man, you dropped off dead. Just go back to your seat if you're going to be dead. Okay, they're not going anywhere. They're not doing anything. It's like, okay, well, when I come back, I hope you're not still here. They're not, they're not moving. They're dead. He picks the strongest word possible to express our relationship with God because of our, oops, I messed up and I did it on purpose. All of that, he says, you're dead. And what can dead people do? Nothing. You can do nothing, right? And so if a person comes in here and they're dead and they're brought back to life, like with CPR, somebody starts doing the CPR thing, right? Or they get the little paddles out and come in here and just boom, boom, you shock them, right? And you've seen that on TV and all of a sudden they're brought back. When they're brought back, they don't look up and go, whoo, glad I pulled that off. (laughs) They're dead. Nobody walks out of the hospital after being dead and said, well, I was dead. And then what I did. See, that's why we look to Jesus because he's the only one who was dead, put away into the tomb and buried and walked out. And nobody went in there with the paddles. Nobody did the CPR. He is the only one who walked. and, And we know how dead works, which is why we're so amazed when dead guy is raised from the dead. And it happens all the time in hospitals. Dead people are raised to life all the time because a life person intervenes. But with Jesus, there was no life person intervening. He goes on to say this, okay? In which, he's talking about you're dead in your sins and transgressions, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Strange way of putting this, the ruler. Like there's a person, there's a power, there's a principality here of the kingdom of the air. And the kingdom of the air is a strange phrase for us. But in the Bible, there is no, in the original Hebrew, Greek, and all that, there is no word that we translate today like culture. You know, when we talk about the world culture, the United States culture, okay, or the subculture, this is a way that they would phrase culture. That there is a ruler, there is a, a power that is over the culture. And this culture, it's just kind of in the air. When you go to this country, it's just kind of in the air. When you go to that country, it's in the air. And you used to live according to the ways of the world and to this culture. And there's a force behind that. There's an entity behind that. It's a spirit that is now at work in those who are disobedient. And see, some of us are disobedient because we're just going with the flow. This is what people do. This is how my friends do it. This is how you know, generations have done it. This is how parents have done it. This is how my neighbors do it. And we're going with the flow. And because of that, we have lived a life of transgression and sin, going with the flow. And he says there's a power behind that. There's a spirit behind that. And that is why we're disobedient. And most of us wouldn't even call it that. We would call it normal, natural. He goes on and says, all of us, he puts himself in there, Paul, the guy who writes, you know, a lot of the Bible here, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature. There's something in us. It's not just a mistake. It's an on purpose thing in us that wants things we know are not good for us. Wants things that we know are not good for others. Wants things that we know are negative and bad. It doesn't matter what God's law says. You have your own law. There's a law of human nature, and there's something in you that wants to violate that. And all of us have given in to those cravings. And all of us has followed those desires and those thoughts. He goes on, he says, like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Objects of wrath. This this violent destruction. Now, this is what's interesting. I, I, I know right now there's just one passage on the screen. But you can go back and read this whole thing in context. I hope you do. And we assume wrath is what God does. But that is not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, you are the object. You are the center of a violent destruction. And it ain't got nothing to do with God. It is purely the consequences of the path you're on, the decisions you're making. It is deserved that your relationships fall apart because look how you are in your relationships. You're all about what you can get out of instead of what you can put into it. And then when it all falls apart, you want to blame God. And it's not about God. 
That, that relationship came to a violent end. Why? Because somebody was following transgressions and sins, doing what was natural, giving in to cravings. And it was a violent end. Your finances are a wreck. And it's not God. God's not up there just saying, well, let me just mess with them and destroy everything. No, 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 no. You followed the path of the current where uh, you know, people live on 127% of their income. What does that mean? For every $100 they make, they're spending $127 going in debt. Eventually it caught up with you. Everything went to pot. You can't blame God. You followed the culture. You followed the spirit that made you disobedient with what God says about how to manage your finances. And now you have come to a violent financial ruin. You see, and this, this is natural. And when we look at that, we sit, listen, when you look at other people, you go, didn't you see that coming? Are you surprised? You got what you deserved. That's exactly what we would say. So what are we supposed to do? And I love this. I love the next word. Just the next word as Paul gets into it. It says this, but, but, and all this can change. That's what but means. But means everything before this can change. But means everything up until this moment can be different. But because we decided to do better, because we made some promises, because we pulled ourselves up by the bootstraps, what can dead people do? Nothing, but because of his great love for dead people, God, who is rich in mercy. Because God loves dead people and has such rich mercy, he has more mercy than he knows what to do with. That's how rich people are, right? They got more money than they know what to do with. He is rich in mercy. He's got an overflow of mercy. What is that? In other words, because of God's rich love for us and his mercy, He does for dead people what dead people can never do by themselves, even when they're dead and deserve to be dead. You see, and that's exactly what happens. Going all the way back to Adam and Eve, we are dead in our sins. God says, look, I just want you to trust me. And when you don't trust me and violate that trust, you're dead. We say the same thing. You're dead to me, right? You look at other people and say, you're dead to me. I can't trust you. Because here's the thing. When somebody violates your trust, what can they do? To fix that. And you may give them a whole lot of conditions and you may give them a whole lot of things they have to do. And still at the end, if they fulfill all the obligations, you're still holding out some reservation, aren't you? Why? Because they're dead. And the only way that relationship comes back to life is if you show mercy. Because dead people cannot fix their problems. They're dead. And he said, but because of God. And see, that's not how religion works. Here's how religion would write this statement, okay? I know you were a mess and you were a wreck, but I started going to church and decided to do better. But I got a Bible and started reading it. But I gave some money. But I said, I'm sorry. But I did all that. That's how religion is. See, it takes the dead person and says, well, you were dead, but glad to see you're trying to do better. You're dead. And the only way you become undead is when somebody who has life also has mercy. He goes on, he says, but this God that had mercy made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in our oops mistakes, didn't mean to, it is by grace you have been saved. Grace, you did not deserve it. You didn't earn it. You weren't worthy of it. He just gave it. And see, this is the beautiful part about grace. Grace, the credit doesn't go to the person who receives the grace. The credit always goes to the person who gives the grace. And it was God who made us alive with Christ. He's brought you back to life, okay? Think of it this way. The guy who brought you back to life with the paddles. The guy who brought you back to life with CPR. The guy who brought you back to life with Christ, with what Jesus did. And Paul, it's so interesting that Paul writes this because Paul was an authority on grace and mercy. I mean, he's writing this from a prison and he's not even complaining about prison. He's in prison because he keeps talking about Jesus being raised from the dead and it's aggravating all the powers that be. So here he is in prison and he's not complaining about prison. You know why? Because he knows he deserves to be in prison. Not for preaching about Jesus. He deserves to be in prison because... He started out an enemy of the church, an enemy of Christians, an enemy of Christ himself, and he did everything he could to persecute them, including overseeing their execution and killing them. Innocent people were put to death because of Paul. 
because of him. And so if God had showed up and said, you're coming against my people, you're coming against my son, I'm trying to do something and you're standing in the way, poof, you're gone and you deserve it. Hey, if nothing else, put you in prison and you deserve it. So Paul sitting in prison, he goes, I'm in prison for preaching the gospel, but if it wasn't the gospel, I should be in prison for killing innocent people. So I'm not going to complain about it because this is justice. I deserve to be here. But the fact that I am alive and the fact that he has used me and that he is speaking to me, that he has a relationship with me, that Jesus appeared to me, that he's called me, that he affords me the opportunity to pour into your lives in a positive direction, that is nothing but God's grace and God's mercy. So I am not going to fuss about any kind of justice. I am going to just relish in his love and his grace and his mercy. So much so that every letter he wrote, he started out with grace and peace and mercy. He is an expert in receiving grace because he knows how dead he was. He goes on, he says, and God raised us up. God did this. We didn't get better. We didn't self-heal. We didn't go to a self-help program. We didn't figure out our problems. God showed up and got us up with Christ and then seated us. I love that word seated. He established us. He has rooted us. He has planted us with him in the heavenly realms. In other words, it's more than just this life. He has established us in some eternal capacity here in the realms with Christ Jesus. And so he is attaching God's grace with the activity of Jesus. He's attaching God's mercy with the activity of Christ. He goes on and says, and he does all of this in order that the coming ages, everybody in the future, might sh- that he might be able to show the incomparable um, riches of his grace. He did this to make us on display for not how just God is, because he is a just God. We've seen that. He puts us on display to show how gracious he is, expressed in kindness all through Christ Jesus. Because of Jesus Christ, we are not getting what we deserve. We're getting things we don't deserve. And then he says this powerful phrase. If you you ever grew up in church, you might have heard this. He says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's by grace what God did for you that you are saved through faith. It is by grace you're brought back to life. It is by grace that you are avoiding consequences to some of your decisions. It is by grace that even when you have to face the consequences, you are doing it with your loving Father cheering you on, supporting you, and helping you. It is by grace that you are rescued through faith, through belief, through trust, because that's what that means. You see, What does the dead person do when the person runs in here with the paddles and starts to shock the heart? They do nothing. They do nothing. They just lay there. The body just surrenders to the person who is working. It is absolute trust because a dead person can't do anything but lay there. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift. A gift of God, not by any effort or works of your own. No one can boast. No one can boast. See, all of the glory goes to the giver of grace, not the recipient. I mean, if that was to happen, if if you were just to drop dead in the auditorium, somebody came in, did the CPR, they did the paddles, they rushed you off, you wouldn't get up and go, man, I really pulled that off. Just how I pulled that off, that was great. How ridiculous. And yet so often that's what we do. Pray, God, would you help me with my marriage? And things start to work out. We sit there and go, well, what I did was I got us some counseling and then I started doing this and I just man up and did what I was supposed to do. Oh, no, 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 no. It was God's grace and he gets all the glory. When God pulls you through the financial trial, when God breaks your addiction and helps walk you out and through recovery and all of that, it is all to the giver of grace, not the recipient. You have nothing to brag about. Because you wouldn't have gone into recovery if God's Spirit hadn't prompted you. You wouldn't have gone into counseling if God's Spirit hadn't been drawing you. You wouldn't have started getting your finances in order and you would have never started developing the habits that you have that have taken you to a different place if God, the giver, had not walked into your dead life. He did this. See, those who trust in their goodness and say, well, wait, 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 I'm a good person. I may not be perfect, right? But I'm a good person. Okay, you just admitted you're not perfect. Those who trust in their goodness always have to worry about how good is good enough. You may say you're a really good person. My question is, okay, are you a good enough person? Well, what do you mean good enough? I mean good enough like to go to heaven with God. 
Are you good enough that God would look at you and say, yeah, they're a good person? Here's what we'd immediately say. Well, I know I'm not perfect. And you know why we'd say that? Because we know that we're not good enough in our own standards. Because you know that no matter how good you are, you know you can do better. You know no matter how good you are, you're grading yourself on a curve. You know no matter how good you are, you've dropped the ball in your own standards. So you always have to worry is how good is good enough. And you do when we say, well, I'm a good person, you're comparing to somebody who's worse than you. <laughs> that's what we do. We always compare down, right? At least I'm better than them. Well, here's the question. What if that's not the standard? What if they're examples of what not to do? <laughs> okay? Are you good enough? Scripture goes on and says, for we are God's workmanship. Like he was making something. He was crafting something. He was constructing something. And he was doing it for a purpose. Created in Christ Jesus to to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So for those who have been saying, well, wait a second, wait a second. I thought Christianity was all about being good and doing good. If it's all about God's grace, if this is all about God's grace, if it all comes down to God's grace, where do the good works come in? I mean, where does the going to the church and and helping people and giving to the poor and giving them money and, uh, you know, volunteering and serving, where does all that good stuff come in? You know, love your neighbors, you love yourself, all of that stuff. If it's not about good works and it will never come down to good works, where does good works really come in if it's all about God? And it's right here because he says, God made us and crafted us to do good things, but you died in the process and you're dead. So when he comes in and he boom, shocks the paddles, when he comes in and he breathes new life and he raises you up in a brand new life, he raised you up not because you deserved it. You deserve to be dead. He raised you up because he's not finished with those good works he created for you to do in the first place. In fact, he goes on, Paul goes on a couple of chapters later in chapter four and he says like this, as a prisoner for the Lord, I'm in jail As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you received. You see, I'm I'm, I'm asking you, since you were dead and you've now been brought to life, would you live a life worthy of one being brought back to life? Would you do that? And I love it because Paul does not negotiate with God. I mean, he could say, okay, tell you what, God, you get me out of prison and I'll live a life that's worthy. No, he says, as one who's in prison, probably deserve to be here. Live a life who's worthy. He's not trying to cut a deal. He knows that there's some justice here. But he also knows that there's grace and mercy, and he's received all of it. And so he's telling you, as someone who is still on the inside cutting no deals with God, I'm telling you the deal is always to his advantage. We were dead. So if you're sensitive to him, if you're aware of him, if there's something on the inside that makes you feel guilty when you do something wrong, that is God breathing into you. That is CPR taking place right now right? And if the person who like ate bad, I mean, it was like a diet of nothing but Krispy Kreme donuts and hamburgers and everything else. And they die of the heart attack. And then all of a sudden the EMTs rush in, they shock them, they CPR, they bring them all back and they go, "Woo, man, let's celebrate. Let's go have some Krispy Kremes. You'd look at him and go, dude, just, you ought to die. You should have died. We should have left your butt alone. Right? Hey, some of you have been this way. Okay. Some of you have been this way. You had some really bad, dangerous, life-threatening habits. You went through medical treatment and you have resumed the bad habits. There are people in your life that will never say it to your face that are just thinking, well, next time your butt's going to lay dead. I ain't paying that bill. And you go, wow, that's so harsh. No, that's justice. And when we see God's justice, all we want to see is he's harsh. We never want to look in the mirror and say, I deserve that. You know, when the marriage gets put back together and you continue the bad habits, The next time it falls apart, everybody around you is going, saw that coming. That's justice. So let let me paint this picture. I I just had this image come to my mind when I was preparing this message. It's like walking out on the battlefield after a great battle, and there are slain bodies everywhere, bloodied and mangled and torn apart. There are thousands of them, and everyone on the battlefield is dead because they have killed one another. It started because somebody was selfish, and somebody wanted what they wanted, and they went back and forth. That They took up arms, they pointed at each other, and they killed each other, nation against nation, raging out of sinful desires, cravings of the flesh. It was just the natural flow of the way the culture was going at the moment, and it erupted in violent war, and now thousands are laid on the battlefield dead. 
can't do anything. They're dead. And out of his great mercy, God walks onto the battlefield and raises them to life. And as soon as lung, the, the air fills their lungs, they pick their guns back up, point them at each other, and start to shoot again. All of us would go, that's insane. Why are they doing that when they have a second chance? And that's exactly what Paul is saying. See, he is saying, you are not saved because you are striving to do good. We should strive to do good because we're saved. We were de- doing it our way led to us being cut off from God and other people. And we were dead. It is only by grace and only by mercy that he has moved into our life, opened our eyes, opened our hearts, prompted us to move towards him. So we are good in response as if the person who got off the floor looks at the MTs, tears running down their face, embrace them and walk out and say, I'm a different person now. And that's exactly the language that the Bible uses over and over, especially in the gospel. Because he didn't raise you to life to send you out on your own. It uses these phrases. A new birth. Go to the next slide, please. A new birth. Hello, next slide, please. Or did we freeze? New birth, born of the Spirit. He says, I want you to be born again, not of flesh and blood, not of water and all. I want you to be born again of the spirits. I'm going to bring you back to life. Like a mother gives birth to a baby. I'm going to give new birth to you through the spirit. He says a new life. And we talk about life in the spirit. Talked about that last week. And so he says, look, when you get up from here, you get a start over a new starting point. And it's not alone. It's now by the spirit, not by the culture, not by what mom and daddy taught you, not by grandparents, not by everything else. It is a new birth. Everything starts over Born of the Spirit, because he's the one who brought you to life. It is a new life being guided by the Spirit, because he's the one who now fills your lungs and fills your life. And that's the expression. So the question is, well, what must I do? Because we're people of action, right? And if it's not about good deeds and it's not about works, surely I have to do something. I mean, what is the part I play in the process? If it's all God's grace and mercy, what do I do? And there's two things you do that you do simultaneously. Simultaneously. Let's go back and look at the verse one more time, okay? It says, for it is by grace, that's what he does, that you have been saved through faith. And there it is. What do I do? Trust. I just trust. I trust that God started something, God's going to finish something. I trust that God's the one behind this. I trust the fact that I now feel guilty over things I used to not feel bad about. I trust the fact that I am desiring to change. I trust the fact that there's some type of conviction happening on the inside. I trust all of this that's going on and that is happening from God. I'm attributing it to him. I'm trusting and I'm believing. It's a gift. So here it is. There's two things that we're going to do. First of all, I want you to understand, just as simple as I can put it, fewest words possible. God initiates, I participate. God initiates, I participate. When you're dead, somebody rushes in and initiates the resurrection, right? They initiate resuscitation. They initiate everything. What do you do? What do you do? You participate. Why? Well, if you're dead, you're dead. You can't do anything. But while they are resuscitating you, as you start to come to life, you can sit there and go, quit that, stop that, no, get away from me. <laughs> right? As they, as they start to bring you back, you can walk off or you can surrender and participate. And the two things, there's only two things that you can do here. And here they are. And it happens simultaneously. Receive and believe. I would lay there and receive the treatment. Just receive it. And then I would believe. What does that mean? I would trust in the one who brought it. I would look up at the MT. I'd look up at the doctor. I'd look up at the nurse. I'd look up at whoever's treating me, and I would surrender and receive their treatment, and I would put my trust in them. I would receive what they're doing, and I'd put my trust in them. And it happens almost simultaneously where you're not sure if I'm believing first and receiving next or receiving first and believing next. But here's what the apostle John said when he started out his whole gospel. He said to everyone who received him, just gave him access and believed in his name, his authority, what he was doing, why he was doing it. He gave them right to be children of God. It wasn't because they were good, not because they were trying better. They were dead, and he stepped into their life, and they just received it and then believed in him. And that was it. And every life that's ever been changed radically by God 
by Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit, the only things they did was this. They received and they believed. So then whenever he would say, here's what I want you to do, they would receive it and they would believe it. And it wasn't what they did that earned it. They were already saved before they ever started working. Paul was right with God before he ever wrote a letter, before he ever preached a sermon. Why? Because a dead man was found on the road by Jesus who came in and breathed life into him. And Paul received it and believed it. As you bow your heads, close your eyes, as we you know, get quiet in this last moment here. For some of you who are so anxious about whether you're good enough, trying to be good, constantly apologizing for all the stuff you've done wrong, and you should, you should say you're sorry, you should own up to it, you could fess up to it every single time. But to feel that your heavenly Father wants to kick you out and to get rid of you because of every little infraction that's happened. I hope right now that you can hear that still small voice, not mine, but the one on the inside of you, affirming what I'm saying. That he loves you and it's that conviction you have over your wrongs that confirm he's with you, he is for you, and working on your behalf. You are saved to do good works. You are not saved by them. You are dead. And if there is anything in you right now that is leaning towards him, searching for him, anything in you right now that is remorseful over things you have done, things you have said, and what your life has been up to this point, if there's anything there, it is because God has initiated that and he is bringing life to your dead spirit. I'm just asking you today, are you willing to receive and believe? And if you are, as a sign of testimony, would you do the courageous thing and just take your hand up and say, yes, I'm receiving. Thank you. I believe. I receive. Thank you. I see hands, several. Thank you. Heavenly Father, you saw the hands as they were raised, as as an indication of what's going on in their heart. Lord, as they are laying dead before you, your spirit is breathing new life into them. Today, they are born anew with you. They start over today with you because they simply received and they are now trusting you. They are believing that this is you doing something in them, prompting them to respond, prompting them to turn to you. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for breathing new life into dead people today, for truly resurrecting the dead, for for resuscitating our future, (laughs) for for doing something that breaks us from the past and sets us in a different direction. And Heavenly Father, it's not our effort, it's not our works, it's us surrendering to your effort and your works. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for grace and mercy. We don't deserve it. Every bad thing that comes to us is probably of our own doing. That we deserve. But God, today you interrupt that cycle with your grace and your mercy because of your great love for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's in the name of your Son we pray. Amen. Amazing grace.